Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Ferris. I'm the copywriting and design assistant at the Poetry Project. Uh, and oh, my screen just froze. There we go. <laughs> and I'm so excited to be hosting tonight's reading with Jonah Mixon Webster and Rosie Stockton. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my coworker, Roberto Montes, our event tech, Matty D'Angelo, and our event moderator, Anna Kreinberg, for being here tonight with me and for helping steer the virtual helm. I so enjoyed thinking these two poets' works alongside each other and think their works echolocate off one another in very meaningful and moving ways, and I'm radically motivated by the surprise, the voltas of their respective and intersected works. So I'm so excited to get to their readings in a moment. But before we begin the evening's program proper, I have a few reminders to share. Anna's adding a link to the chat now with some helpful Zoom tips and best practices. Please note that we are recording tonight's event. You're welcome to have your camera on or off as you prefer, but if your camera is engaged, it's possible your Zoom square will end up in the archived recording. Tonight's event is being live captioned by Otter AI, the transcript of which you may access by clicking the red live link in the top left of your screen and selecting view stream. The transcript will subsequently open in a new browser window. If you have any Zoom questions or run into any difficulties, please don't hesitate to reach out to anyone with staff or moderator after their name and we'll be glad to get things sorted out. Anna is now adding to the chat the Poetry Project's Safer Spaces statement. Whether the room we share and make is virtual or physical, proximal or remote, we remain steadfast in building with you all a community and environment that challenges and resists ongoing, imbricated structures of hierarchy and harm. We invite you to join us in this work throughout tonight's event, and may we all carry it with us well beyond this evening. If this event were taking place in person, we would be gathered together as has been done for the past 54 years at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. St. Mark's Church stands on the site of the family chapel of Peter Stuyvesant, built in 1660. In his time as Director General of New Netherland, Peter Stuyvesant began and supervised the direct chattel slave trade to New Amsterdam. He himself enslaved 40 Africans, the most of any person in the colony. These enslaved Africans stolen lives and labor were used to construct the buildings and streets on this stolen land. St. Mark's Church is located on the unceded homeland of the Lenape people, Lenape Hoking. I am speaking to you from what is called Harlem, which is the unceded homeland of the Wapinger, a Munsee speaking band of Lenape people. Anna is now putting a map in the chat, not to endorse it as complete, but to invite us all to learn continually about the land we occupy, its history and ties. As we gather across various neighborhoods and states, it is important to remember that it's not just some of the land that was stolen or some of the land that needs to be returned, but all of it. It reminds me too that to return the land is not a matter of transferring capitalist ownership, but as many indigenous thinkers have explained, a radical rethinking of belonging and ownership, centering indigenous autonomy and active relationality and responsibility. And tonight and always I'm reminded that apartheid and settler violence continues unabated and escalated in occupied Palestine with over $3 billion in US taxpayer money sent to Israel in 2021. And I'm reminded that international policy and national policy are the same circle, that decolonial work is neither localized nor isolated, and that to return the land and sovereignty in here necessarily means all of it, give it all back, return the land everywhere. And now I'm so excited to turn to Joan, I'll introduce him and then Joan will read and then I'll introduce Rosie and Rosie will read. The title of Jonah Mixon Webster's debut collection is Stereotype, a word that comes from a method of printing from a plate, then image perpetuated without change. And here we are immediately presented with a crisis of production and capitalism and their anxious dependency upon things staying the same, on death producing life producing death. Specifically, we are confronted with capitalism's dependency upon race, racial, racialization, the reification, reification of anti-Blackness, that its survivance depends upon our learned devotion to a toxic stasis, a socialized aversion to radical change. Jonah's writing is here to fuck with that, to upset this global death work. Stereotype is a crash course in form that gives the finger to the very notion of form. As tongue-in-cheek as it is devastating, it's a book that insists blackness and queerness through the poetic canon. 
an intervention into both thought and the act of thinking that's as heady as it is deeply felt, Jonah's writing is an exercise in engaging every register at once and of destroying the very idea of register. It's a self-portrait in a convex mirror where the mirror, the light, and the idea of self are interrogated through and alongside our historiographical and etiological understandings of the classed, racialized, gendered, heteronormative capitalist virus, virus machine of white supremacy and its Janus face anti-blackness. And though death as input and output in the logarithm of American capitalism necessarily animates Jonah's work, he troubles the equation, makes the reified liquid, crowds the equation with language, desire, and stereophonic sound until the equation breaks. He makes room for a more elastic temporality, or rather points out that it's always been elastic, and safe seats in the present past future for ghosts. Engaging the ontological, Jonah thinks through and into the monstrous animus of modernity, the long durée of the transatlantic slave trade. His work insists that pastness is nothing or everything but a position. It lives in the aporia that black life, black queer life are a part of the afterlife of slavery too, and that to imagine new words and worlds, we need to think forward in reverse. Jonah Mixon Webster is a poet and interdisciplinary artist from Flint, Michigan. His debut collection, Stereotype, received the Pan America Joyce Osterweil Award and was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry. He is an alumnus of Eastern Michigan University and received a PhD in English studies from Illinois State University. He is a recipient of a Wyndham Campbell Prize for Poetry and fellowships from Vermont Studio Center, Center for African American Poetry and Poetics, and the Pen Writing for Justice Program. His poetry and hybrid works are featured in various publications, including Obsidian, Harper's, The Yale Review, Jazz and Culture, The Rumpus, The New Republic, and Best American Experimental Writing. And with gratitude, I welcome Jonah Mixon Webster to the Poetry Project. Thank you so much, Wow. I'm like um, a little caught uh, off guard by the intro. Thank you for the intro, Wow. Wow. Um, it's a beautiful intro. Thank you for everybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting emotional. Like right now, I'm seeing everybody. It's like an Easter reunion. Hey, everybody. Carla. Hey, Rob. Rosie. Uh, everybody here. Um, thank you all. A lot of folks here. Um, whew, all right. Let me jump into it so I don't get too um, dismayed. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, so um, throughout this process of, uh, you know, re- working stereotype um, and, and you know, trying to find those inflection points where the work could grow and could breathe. Um, there have been some new additions made, there have been some changes, some added, um, added poems, some added pieces. Um, the sound work that I've been doing um, uh, has been, you know, kind of adding or developing to it. I'm not sure, do y'all hear that dog outside? It's a hood dog outside. I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so with the sound works that I've been doing, um, this blues aria kind of just came up um, in the work. And so um, and so I just um, I, I want to share some of the uh, some of the new work, some of uh, that's going to be featured in a stereotype, um, some of the work that's coming from my forthcoming collection, um, uh, The Promise of Threat. It's a different poetry collection um, uh, forthcoming later. <laughs> oh God, oh God, I shouldn't talk before poems anymore. Well, I wanna incorporate some of the things that you mentioned. Now, you know, your introduction really has me wanting to, to read some specific work. So um, I'm actually going to start with, uh, I'm going to start with uh, one of the pieces, uh, one of the blues pieces that came out here. So I worked with this poem, actually I started writing this poem in 2000, 12, 2013, um, in Ypsilanti at Tower Inn on a like ribbon for um, like the utensils and stuff. Um, and this work has grown and has even has been working on me even now up until this year. And I think it's, I think it's ready. Uh, so um, I'm gonna share, um, so you can hear the, so you can actually hear the, the song. Black ontology number five. Black as if always. 
the blues of a stridulated half note, night gristle, locust chirp, bold neck, wax lips, wet stain, a body thronged hard and buried in the open light, the root of it dug up with a mouth stretched, reaching to scratch the noose from its throat and give everyone a song. But hang around. Ain't nothing to do but hang around. Ain't got no way to make it out. Try to find me some hell. No, I can't be found. So ain't nothing to do but hang around. Ain't nothing to do but hang around. Ain't even got me penny to make a pound. They about took all I had. Who am I now? Well, ain't nothing to do but hang around. Ain't nothing to do but hang out. If I could, I'd run right straight out of town. Don't even need me shoes, just feet on the ground. I ain't nothing to do but hang around. Ain't nothing to do but hang around. Ain't no news to think about. So I'm telling you later, I'm telling you now. There ain't nothing to do but hang around. Ain't nothing to do but hang around. Now imagine if they never would have cut me down. Say imagine if they never would have cut me down. I would have made it. I'll still be found. Feet on the ground. Out of town. I took a penny and make a pound. Out of water and underground Said tell her now that I'll still be found Said I'll still be found Said I will still be found Said I will still be found um, So that was uh, the Hang Around Blues. Um, I wrote the uh, I wrote the lyrics uh, as Angie Fisher, um, who is singing uh, the song, and uh, Dominique Jordan is the flautist um, accompanying her. Um, when I was started getting into this space, you know, this kind of like this blues voice, you know, and um, I also want to Carla here. I want to thank Carla for even um, introducing me to the blues. From I remember in contemporary forms class, I took an undergrad with Carla. Um, uh, we were reading some Kathy Wagner, uh, Kathy Wagner, uh, My New Job, and, and it was a blues form in there. And, and I remember Carla asked, like, does anybody know what form this is? And then immediately struck me, this the blues. Um, and that was one of those moments that kind of really oriented me um, to the form. And now working, reworking in this, um, in this mode, these other things started coming out. Like um, Black consumerism, number zero, the try to blues. Said I try to buy some freedom, but the price too high. My chains too low. Had to sell my brother's dreams down at the store. Oh, why? When you make me cry. Said I try to buy some love, but the price too high. My chains too low. Had to sell my mama ring down at the the stove. Oh, why? Can you make me cry? I said I try to buy some time, but the price too high. My change too low. Had to sell my daddy watch down at the stove. Oh, why? 
when you make me cry. Said I try to buy some peace, but the price too high. My change too low. Had to sell my sister beauty down at the store. Oh, why? When you make me cry. Mm, said I try to buy some kindness, but the price too high. My change too low. Had to sell my auntie smile down at the store. Oh, why? When you make me cry. Said I try to buy some hope, but the price too high. My change too low. Had to sell my uncle dope down at the store. Oh, why? Make me cry. Said I try to buy attention, but the price too high. My change too low. Had to sell my cousin mine down at the stove, oh why? And it make me cry. Always I was a nigga, bad at it. I was always being a nigga even when I wasn't. I was a nigga, somebody's I was always bad at being man even when I was a nigga, I wasn't. I was bad at being a nigga though I wasn't. I was bad at being a nigga, even though I was a real nigga or a bitch nigga or a fag nigga, which I always was, always been bad, always a nigga, though I was bad at it. I was bad, <laughs> nigga. I was always a bad nigga, kept me a hot nigga, always nigga, always a nigga, it's always a damn nigga, it's always a nigga bad at it, and always I was a nigga, and always I was bad and bad and bad at it, really. I'm a real nigga. Because all my niggas say I'm a real nigga. And I bet if you go and ask them niggas, they're going to point at me and say, that's a real nigga, really, though. I'm bad at it. I am. Really. Black of Piss Team number nine. This is what I know about blood. That when I wake in it, my body turns to earth with its gnashing. That when it appears in my piss, all streams run silent. And when I find it in my hands, I cannot recall my name. Here, I offer you a truism. I am not speaking of a cut, nor the way my gut caves into a split to touch my back to some bullet, but of what remains in the image of loss. How it is signifier and referent at once how it pulls from my unending mouth, how at this moment I am sitting in a mess of it, waiting for my legs to stand. How I could leave it as a sign that still reads, nigger, you wasn't even here. You wasn't even here at all. The ghost of Richard Pryor made me do it. Peoria, Illinois. And like any other night, a white man sees me, seeing him, seeing me, I am again dead awake to the modes of awareness. And as it was if him seeing me meant seeing me naked, black, obviously black, ostensibly black, meant seeing me, and you know what I mean already. I mean, you know I was probably wearing something real black, like something blacker than black, something like black jeans or black shoes, black hat, or the black v-neck, black hoodie and a black v-neck under it. And seeing this and seeing me in all of this, man, he knew I was black. And I mean real black, naked black, obviously black, ostensibly black. And within proximity, black still says, hey, give me a cigarette, nigga. To his white friend with me in earshot, chose to say, yeah, nigga, I mean, nigga, I mean, you know what I mean, nigga, 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 to the extent I turn. And while turning, I ask, why do you keep saying nigga so much? And I won't tell you what this white nigga said in response, but it was the stupidest shit I ever heard. And I won't repeat it. And so I said to him, that's the stupidest shit I ever heard. I think you need to stop saying that. He then says swiftly, you can't tell me what to do, nigga. 
nigga, 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 nigga. Come on, nigga. As if saying it meant seeing me, meant seeing me naked. Black, obviously black, definitely black, unequivocally black, and crazy enough to choke the language out of his body. And before I know it, my hand finds the back of this white nigga shirt, snatching it over into a cotton rope with a knot of a fist. I noose, a noose I tighten with every giggle from the crowd. Twitter fingers. At a conceptual poet, artist, whoever, after gone with the wind. Who's eyes guessing you can still be anything you want, her missing? Go on and try on the skin of some others. Like it, don't you? But choose couldn't to come up with some other better context, a kind sin, or, or, or what is it y'all kind calls it? Con, 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 concept, concept. And you said you was trying to show and you wanted us to see what? How that other white woman still own all them skin and grinning black folks? And you wanted her ass state to sue you, right? That was the whole point, right? So then why hasn't you stopped? I guess a bird in the hand is still worth more than 10 in the woods. Ain't that right there, Missy? But come on now, Missy, just between me and you. You did it, cousin, you could, didn't you? One of them red herrings there, ain't you? <laughs> You're like, you and Miss Margaret Mitchell. Because you and me know both both know good and well, then. well, maybe you do, well, maybe you don't. Well, maybe you always knew and just didn't care that those little tweets was always protected by what's called fair use. So that means they couldn't even sue you if they wanted to. <laughs> but you ain't mean to a fan and color folks, right? By pasting somebody dead mammy and trying to fake that voice again, huh? I was probably guessing you ain't think color folks ain't had that feelings to offend, huh? I was guessing the only thing you was out to make was a bad idea, huh? <laughs> but you got people calling you and you calling yourself a concept shell artist. But you ain't that artist. <laughs> you ain't shit. And I'm not all nigger. I'm not all nigger. I'm not all slung neck. I'm not all rope. I'm not all broke back. I'm not all pop pop. I'm not all headshot nor jailbird. I'm not all <laughs> whistle like the white girl. I'm not some Ken of teeth gliding across the Tallahatchie night water. I'm not all gun stippled and spilled blood. Not the boom of red smoke breaking the body open with the new exit wet already. And I'm not all body. I'm not all dead fruit, dark swinging in the tree breeze. And though that is my blood, I'm still not the blood on the leaves. I'm not all cotton mouth. Hello, choke, hood, whip, not all t-shirt slogan and hashtag. I'm not all don't shoot. I'm not all I can't breathe. I'm not some everlasting shadow of dead flesh. Cause even when I die, I'm still not all death. I'm not all brown sugar. Stark, honey, pot, sour diesel, the blues, the blues, the blues and blue dream. No, I'm not all nigga, boy. I'm not all here in this same. Not all is said, not the same haunt. I come not as one nor with nothing. Still, I'm still, and I still got my name. I'm still Jenny. I'm still Laura. I'm still Lawrence. I'm still Emmett. I'm still Mike. I'm still Marie. I'm still Jeremy. I'm still Tamir. I'm still Charlie. I'm still Brianna. I'm still Freddie. I'm still Ayana. I'm still Eric. I'm still Rakia. I'm still Walter. I'm still LaVar. I'm still Sean. I'm still Corinne. I'm still Oscar. I'm still Trayvon. I'm still Amadou. I'm still Sandra. I'm still George. I'm still Elijah. I'm still George. Jordan. I'm still Makia. I'm still Tommy. I'm still Martin. I'm still George. And my mama's still my mama. And my daddy still my daddy and these all are still my brothers and sisters and i still have my house and my job and my school and my room and i still have my garden and i still graduated remember i still had a life before they took that so you tell the story get it right and take all that shit back psalm 6-6 six, six. And this is how a young nigga finds manhood. At once constructed and crushed into the body on his back, drunk cheek to burnt floor, ass wet on fire and lifted toward the sky of the den, a circling of wax wood laths, the circle of his mouth, slop shut, sodden, rugged scratch of skin, no sheath, but slick, not ghost, but gone. And the big homie thinks it's better like this. The mind of the boy muted, in the liquid smoke of his body. His mouth <laughs> muted in the liquid smoke of his body. So even if or when he comes or wakes, there won't be any proof of the undoing. 
beyond basement party on hush, beyond the hips record of bent, beyond nothing ever happened. Not the boxers lobbed, not the throat snuffed, not the picture of one's mother on the wall watching, not the mother crying with her boy crying, not the young paper flesh ripped, not the bed he's made to swim in. Ode to Darnell, the erased Negro in the middle of my name. Darnell, English from the old French Darnell, an annual grass, Lilium Tolent, <laughs> I'm gonna fuck this Latin up. <laughs> Lilium Timulentum, Timulentum. However, the plant was believed to produce intoxication. Two, a variant spelling of Darnall, a habitational name from Old English Darn, meaning hidden, a secret, and Hall, meaning nook. Some nigga once said, Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are even sweeter. So in your name, I listen not for some nightingale to unhook the chime from its would-be throat, save for the whistle of a single flare shot into the total blank of the mind's expanse from where dost thou happy light retain. Upon what sweet and unsober face lie furrow the living shadow? What swarthy grace dost smother your hunger for sun? O oh, darling bloom, a muted horn and fire brush unsounding. If thou truly were a plume of other earth, I would pluck it from its steady to keep only for thyself, etching endlessly the hallowed scores of thy name. Cipher in which I cannot save the gangster disciple in boy's time. For Keontae. And I imagine saying even your almost name would channel your body back from this night. Off the hip, we broke necks looking back from the curbs, lipping onto the crosswalk stage for two men to make eyes at the other. The time of any man's gaze is telling. And this too we talk, leaving our boys behind to procure a seat on the steps of anonymity. In front of a stranger's house, you pull out and I do as you did. You tell me it gets fat. You say, this too, or this too, I say, is a mirage you carry, and through skin we become neighbors. But no, nah, you are no fat. I call your name and your look is blank. You catch me stutter and step. You tell me you've made it. You tell me 26 in secret as if it were the winning lottery number. As if with no logic, you touch me like you could already. You say, I used to be pretty. Said, man, not no more. And I want to sing it for you about whatever and however you want, about the black tattoo tear water, about the body you caught on this night, about the love for your niece you tell to me in the passing minute. And I would do this thing trying to save you with my mouth. With its mirror of color and cold, you ask if I know and I promise I know. You promise nothing. And what I do next is another defeat. Write this, knowing it won't keep you. Incubation. It is 2020 and the city of Flint says, don't boil the water. And I refuse to drink a single drop from any tap or bottle now. I've stopped bathing completely, waiting for rain to slip my skin back on. I eat accessory fruits, mainly from cardboard and cover the rashes on my face with coconut oil to appear more alive. I sit beneath the sun lamp, touching no one. It is 2016 and the city of Flint says, boil the water. My mother lays her head in a couch of her own hair, pulls back the scar from the watermark in her leg, the scalp of her knee giving to the bloody lock. Faucet water hardens into a fang, attacks slowly unfleshes the body altogether. This week, my niece goes live on Facebook, filming her son run in an errant stupor, bad as he is already, vaulting up an obstacle of leather, a base from which to rehearse flight. He lands, runs onto the carpet, the screech following his shade into the mat. He moves his joints to the finish, muscle where his mind angles the floor. 
It is 2014 and the city of Flint says, boil the water. My niece, great nephew and I bowl metallic mac and cheese from the aluminum. We all smash it, heavy and wet the taste in the soup of our mouth. TJ plays the last noodle with his finger, consumes it, says, where's the meat? It is 2017 and the city of Flint says, boil the water. I undo the gauze from the stitched together incision below my navel. The procedure, an embolization to loosen the knot of veins growing inside of me. And to clean the wound, I use a room temperature bottle of purified drinking water, more gauze, and a plain bar of antibacterial soap. I apply a small amount of Bactine to the area and stick on a hospital grade bandage. I press onto it lightly for 10 seconds. It is 2014 and the city of Flint says, don't boil the water. I lie into a nightmare of sound. Again, there is no rest. The whole house and hood is washed in the voice of some agent installed in the park fern projects adjacent to the crib, tucked in the half of a half of an acre, an alarm, a holler on blast every night from 10 p.m. until we all sleep it off. This lasts for a year, despite complaint. Now, Another day starts like this, stretched by the mile of voice, sounding off from the intersection of Pearson and Clover Lawn, throwing itself to the undead, which lay some distance elsewhere. The broke record of it, in the water, in the air, in the dream. Warning, warning, you have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified, leave immediately, warning, Warning, you have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified, leave immediately. Warning, warning, you have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified, warning, you have violated an area for warning, you have violated an area protected by security. Warning, 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 you have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified, leave immediately. Warning, 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 you have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified, leave immediately. Warning, 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 you have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified. Leave immediately. Warning, 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 as counter to, yes, we did this with our full knowing, education and training notwithstanding. Surely you can trust us now. It is 2020 and the city of Flint says, boil the water. Bills, flyers, pamphlets, bags, bills, manuals, mailers, bills, boxes, bills, bottles, bottle caps, bills, a junk flood in the streets overflowing our houses now. Every piece of litter and literature yelling, consume, consume. It is 2019 and the voice on the radio says, have you or your family been affected by the Flint water crisis? Does your child's blood level show evidence of lead poisoning? Have you noticed any rashes or developmental issues in your child? If so, you may be eligible to file a claim and receive compensation for, your, for you and your child's suffering. Please call us at the law offices of, it is 2015 and the city of Flint says, boil the water. My boy Q posts a picture of his back bubbling with fissures and an even spread. Having bathed in the city's Northeast waters, the contagion carries itself into the host, bearing witness to a feast of skin and other soft metals. Thank y'all, thank y'all so much. Wow, Jonah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm, with, I'm without words, thank you. <laughs> Truly incredible, I think we all, and you especially, deserve to take a, a breath before we move forward. Yeah, thank you so much. And 
with that we'll, we'll move together onwards uh, to, to Rosie Stockton. Rosie Stockton's debut collection, Permanent Volta, takes its name from the Volta of a sonnet, the turning point, the twist in thought or upheaval or surprise of the logic of the poem. To operate continuously in this torsion, to define things by what they're not, by belaying off their edges, all of which I think is to say to be queer, which is to say to desire, is a project of Rosie's work. It's a book that puts pressure on its own logic and thought world, thereby letting in a potentiality for more. Looking up the world word Volta leads me to two other entries that I believe animate and are haunted backwards by Rosie's work. I am brought to Volt, the unit of electric potential named after Alessandro Volta, a physicist and chemist and credited as the inventor of the battery, which, to, which is to say a ghost of the industrial revolution. It brings me also to the Volta River, a river system in Ghana named so by 15th century Portuguese gold traders, which is to say capitalist slavers who turned from or with gold to capturing and sending enslaved Africans to the early American colonies to make more gold, to turn death into gold. What I think is triangulated in this etymological tension and relationality is that permanent Volta is a text in and through which queerness and queer desire are abutted with the ongoing more abund or boros of industry, technology, capital, and the gendered, race, sexed, and class death systems it reifies to us so as to both feed and destroy itself. Rosie's poems are flooded with desire and longing as they are caught in the haunted waters of late, late stage capitalism. Railing against the psychic and real slash imaginary death cult of ownership and individualism, Permanent Volta is a switchy book, revolution, or reveling in the imaginary disruptive, in asking or demanding while also being asked or demanded. How do we desire a way out of a world that doesn't desire desire? As they say, what if we kissed in the Amazon locker? As I would translate, what if we burned it the fuck down? Rosie Stockton is a poet based in Los Angeles. Their first book, Permanent Volta, is the recipient of the 2019 Sawtooth Prize and is just out from Nightboat Books. Their poems have been published in Jubilat, Social Text Journal, Apogee, Mask Magazine, and Wonder. They are currently a PhD student in Gender Studies at UCLA, and I'm so thrilled to welcome Rosie Stockton to the Poetry Project. Hi, everybody. Wow. Wow. I'm speechless. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Will, for that exquisite introduction. Um, I'm, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm speechless. Um, thank you so much. And of course, Jonah, so, so powerful. Thank you for your incredible reading. I feel so luck lucky to know you and to, to be reading with you tonight. Um, and thank you, Poetry Project, of course, especially Will for organizing and Anna and Maddie, Roberto, um, for putting this all together for all of your labor and care. Um, I, and I'll, I want to start by saying I'm zooming in from Los Angeles on unceded Tongva land. And it, it really is such a pleasure um, to be reading for the project, which um, is such a looming place, poetry institution in my mind where I really hung out there a lot in my early 20s before I moved to Detroit. And so it maintains this kind of mythological status. So it's very exciting to be reading, um, rereading with the Poetry Project. And I so wish we could be in person. And it's so great to see so many friends and loved ones here, especially people from Michigan and, and Eastern Michigan University, Carla, Rob, Addie, um, so, so great to see you. And yeah, I'm so overjoyed to be reading with Jonah, who I overlapped with um, in Ipsy, even though we weren't at EMU at the same time, we we're, I feel very connected by kind of being in the program in Jonah's wake. And um, when Jonah, when you invoked the Tower Inn, I'm like so deeply there. There's a poem in my book from one night Leah and I went to get pizza and it's just this like shitty iconic diner in Ypsilanti. And the Miami Heat was playing a basketball basketball game and we I remember we made a sestina from like six words from one of the sentences that the newscaster said about the basketball game so that tower in is like so deeply in my book too um 
And yeah, also thinking about Rob and Carla's contemporary forms class and thinking so much about form and so much Jonah about um, how form informs your work and similarly how, you know, the formal experiments in my book were really influenced by my time um, studying at EMU. So anyway, obviously, if you haven't um, already pre order the reprint of stereotype you have to it's coming out june 15th the poems on the page are just as amazing as they are you know as jonah reading them and i also wanted to say i took today to revisit some of jonah's work um just you know just revisiting it because we were going to read together and i found this beautiful quote in a conversation between jonah and banu kapil that i wanted to read just before i started reading that says this is jonah I do feel that poetry, especially poetry that explores the deep affects of embodiment can help to achieve not only a togetherness between individuals, but a togetherness of the self, the experience and energy of integration, expansion. Um, and that just really, that really resonates me and also with, um, with, with some of like the themes that were coming up for me in Permanent Volta. So yes, this, this book just came out, Permanent Volta from Nightboat Books. Um, two weeks ago now, very exciting to hold it in my hand. Um, I want to say thank you to Nightboat Books, you know, that when I was living in Detroit, my friend Maya ran this little bookstore called Ditto Ditto, and if you are a Detroit person, you know what I'm talking about, and she really carried, um, like, used poetry books, and then, like, the whole Nightboat catalog for some reason, and so I was always, like, surround, I was, like, just bought all the Nightboat books when I was there, and I was always surrounded by Nightboat books in my home, and so it's an honor to have them. Um, it's an honor to have the, you know, this book find a home there with, with books that were always in my home. So, so I'll start um, by reading from the first section um, called No Wages, No Muses. And this first one is called Poem. Unmused ethnography of suns and smashed windows. Oh, dead decorous and phenomenological our wages, error cum laude, through fogs and fences, riotous our flood, sing with me. Genre riot. Let's get this multitude going with coffee and snacks and this metaphysical need. I know that things can get bigger big enough to clash. This discord, it will be endless, buckling like water, sounding soft the din of our titanic breathing. These conditions are threatening. We must bring a sheath, a rose petal tinderbox. Let our handles blur, let the latent slogan roll, become complicit with water. Let's tend our bricks together, destroy our vowels and desire to pay our debts, sink the molecular sounds of our exhale, liquidate our cash to its pre-egoic state, set up shop in this dried up pen factory, make the shore resplendent. Let's press down hard. What we write once shows up three times, carbon, paper, skin, signing away our water. Our bodies clash against cloth, and this is proof of being. Clouds fallen around us, sky cast off by hope. Oh, narrative is printed on my breathing. Oh, that I can't prove even this fact of sky. We know it feelingly, glossy, obscured light with veils on veils, bathing in the pavement, hair hinged to the porch that birthed it. This is our strategic grievance, the retaliation of the streets, a chamomile chamber with daybreak that reeks of nubile birds. But parallel are songs, parallel and breathing. Let's dream up what comes next, rambunctious dust and orchestral clash, and they will know us flooded with presence, hiding behind the flora we planted thorny morning, ivy over our eyelids. Let them look at us, let them ask for our one word. Oh, I RSVP to that bobbing chest we built with the state's nails and history's forests. 
Let's make room for the microphonic waves to swallow finches burrowed into time's expansion to show us our bodies all those years from now. It is time. Can't you hear that far off sound? Eunuch of industry. I've got some human requirements. Hornet, injury, toothbrush. Technology invented my need and I do. I need against schedules lodging my hunger for you and cement sound. What if we kissed in the Amazon locker? Crude oil massage, your hand lotion on my choke points, your most fresh sacrifice box like blue apron. There's no time to eat, rotting in a stoop's sunlight. Box trucks and networks can be so lonesome, so owned, and I am alone tonight, trying to remember that we don't want what we think we want. Oh, Plato, my Plato, I'm calling off our sessions. I'm blocking your image. And of all your shadows, what about the shadow their chains cast? This one is called Hush Little Baby, Don't Say a Word. In hung throneness, a brick's paradise is a window's anticipation caressed and gleeful on the factory belt. Blushing, bought, fantastical, this litany on strike, a refusal of objects glitched out, possessed and silent in hypnotic chant. With dull rings and songless birds, with overturned carts and bowls, with a broken looking glass, humming with the sweetest baby in town. Oh mother, there is a violence in naming, in showing up to say, can we love with inadequate politics, apart and pained? Poem riveted to poem, emerging in me this feeling, we must invent what we see. Um, I'm gonna read from a series of five poems called Material Memory. Um, and these were, were poems that I all wrote. Um, I had, a, a, every day I would walk my dog to the edge of the Detroit River and, and you know, either like watch the ice float down it or, or you know, just watch the, um, the big freighters go by. And um, I think just, you know, thinking about that river also as a border um, between the US and Canada uh, really informed this series. So material memory. Fearing a gaze that casts stone, moments of indecision, unable to conceive of how to forgive. Nobody could, and neither could I, decouple the terracotta from its dirt, collectivize a desire so outwardly, walk the dog into abstract formalism, into a form that doesn't react unthinkingly, that sees itself as subject, sees itself as seeing. The breakdown had layers. I'm not sure what I said last night after three whiskeys, but I knew I wanted you to find me, my porous body, and not there, old, ancient even. Basing identity on want, I with my sheer impatient hopes, ripening at dawn how the fruit appears in sheets of a dream, demanding the angle, demanding the off-screen gaze, castrating myself as audience, as dog, fixated on where my river stops and yours starts. I had feared my own contagion until we caught it or not. Expressing no symptoms, we were unable to know the disease. Many states of water and blame. Something didn't sound right. Tones slip because the air is cold. Can't forgive the walls where manic effacement suffixed with self and objects become untrustworthy for what they have seen and done and how you have seen them and how they have seen you. 
And when the object becomes subject through a fucked process, you zoom in as far as the app allows until better vision comes. Like how I abolished my identity, but it keeps coming back. With blurred color intonations and tidal pull, where the lake is not the lake and the water floats on water in its most apogeic form. That's where I'd like to live, in a palm full of ice. Put a down payment onto winter current and cash my shit into the shore. I press my body against the cold river rail. Over many years, it will remind me what I have done when I didn't believe to be doing anything. And like we have said to each stranger and their wallet for years, do not touch me, especially not with your eyes. God. Warmer weather and time expansion, a river that doubles as a border to experience a not seeing. It is possible all deja vu is intergenerational. We had learned it once, but we have forgotten and we can't explain it when it's there. Mouth mouthing the ghosts of phrases gives us the approximation of the thing as if there were a thing to approximate. You're all olive juice and I say illy too. Hamevu is a phrase to designate something you think you should know but have the sense when you see it that you don't. I look out at a mist and each day it becomes newer. Symbolic order flocks above, reflecting clamor in waves, in your eyes, in my own. My hair whips my face, my fatigue. Here are verbs that leave a residue of trauma. I think I'll pass that along with the inheritance, which reminds me, they say, how pleasant the neighborhood used to be, how accumulated each brick and uninhabitable. Aren't you worried, asked a furrowed brow, etched from daddy landlord lifestyle elision despite wages of wrinkle cream and capital. We often are not asking the questions we mean to ask. And as I stare into my mist, I sublimate my mantra. My dog takes a piss and I try to reroot habit more accurately. I miss you the most the moment before we part. All desire mimics that brink. Before I have time to enact ritual where I mirror stage my way into language and paranoid fragments, burn the toast and all the used to be's that forget more than they remember. Um, so I'm gonna read a few from a section called Hagiography hey and these were all poems that were um, originally written in um, as sonnets, um, but through the process of editing and um, sort of letting them disperse across the page, they took a very different form. This one is called No Means. Time wraps itself back up before the week starts so slowly. It can't theorize sensation. It can't stay put deep in a ditch the way I am backward dreaming lunch break. My worst genre is sex talk, how it can't keep pace with the leaves rate of bloom inert under my heliological need. Pointing out the trance-like underdeveloped trauma hypothesis, it is always just a hint the way my meat doesn't want to rearrange the words all the time. It doesn't want lips to sip, opening with a jaw clicking discarded. Remember how I make flowers cry on the side of the paved parts of day, most private the time it already promised. No means, no time to say when I decide to give it all away. And for what, I wonder, what performance solves the proof of interiority? How to say yes. 
Overhearing another's photograph, dragging public proof, it can't claim any of us decided the shade of red desk where the radio delivers narrative baby. My broken Volta aches out a turn, but I'm late and dusty where I live. My boss dissolves panoptic and the doctor's note is an obsolete genre like the hospital's parking fees where requisite lines take longer than death takes, and the buildings blend and block the amount of sun in the asphalt space that slows the flow of traffic. When I was born, they dimmed my mother's pain too far, and there I was, claustrophobic birth canal, wet tissue on soft skull. And my mother said, never mind this certification, never mind this oceanic break like trying to unknow the Big Dipper. An impacted decision leaving me a common procedure with twisted chronology, coerced consent, a sludgy aporia, as if it wasn't too late when anyone said yes or never. More money. Deadlines crush slowly like an architect's model. The beams don't come that long here, he said, forgetting unbuilt lightning, how it shakes my desk, failing my poem as it tries to pass as plot and city sounds, where I break asleep knowing when he is not watching, he is listening to me and my exhaustion dreams. I've ad blocked them, a costly service and my time will pay for it. The joke of clocking in leaves this vestibule poem broke in the VIP room, asking the boss of myself for more hours when I meant to say more money. Now all I've got are more hours when I meant more money and just like the live record skips, my velvet genre breaks. Plot and, and a poem clocks in for the envoy that hasn't a thing to deliver, but more time to mean money. So um, I was gonna read, there's a, there is a prompt that Rob would give us in the Contemporary Forms workshop um, to write translations of Arthur Rimbaud poems um, from the English to the English, and then sort of justify uh, your translation, you know, throughout the workshop. And uh, that was a really productive um, practice for me, you know, re reading Rimbaud with Rob alongside Kristen Ross and Kathy Acker and Sean Bonney and Sarah Larson's translation of Rimbaud. Um, and so a few of those poems from like way back then Made it, in, made it into this book. So I wanted to read one of them since I think Rob is here. Um, this one's called Sovereign Exhaustion and it's after a poem called Tale by Rimbaud. Dildonic, my massacre, a neo-glory hold liberal fantasy, chafed, devotional and shadowy, this truth, this piety, Generous my justice, a snapped little twig, oozing like dry ice, the other side of desire. Embellish the oxytocin that could ever honeycomb an inbox toward revolution in total coming together, in synchronic transmission of global and mountainous deprogrammed love. With my poetic prosthesis in your most laced crevasse, I slash the throats of my parking spaces, my metric days, my meter fees. I am always so on time for you. I walk around the block with the smashed plastic seashore flooding past the rocks to the downtown of my heart just so I'm not too early. And you know my mind's tied up in imagining the casual riot where the fence isn't chained to fence, isn't keeping out our stage stamina, keeping track of our charging cycles. I am dissolving in the waiting room of the Toyota dealership, an oil change splashed on my pronoun, possessive adjective on corporate forms, waiting out the twisted suspense, of a law firm bailing out, 
the logic of Baal. Better to destroy the boat, my aching trees, than patch the sinking hole. Let's start over my ride, my tectonic edge play, with the concept of who I am showered in petroleum veins, like I want to be together, but I also want to be left alone. My INFP commie conundrum, my introvert version of togethering, my close to death daisy, my weeded bouquet. Lilac evening approaches. My gilded horror so unspoken, I can finally speak. Look now, the evaporation of traumaed bank accounts, where we annihilate ourselves to mediate our dyings. This shadow self locked up in self-love groupons, this Medicaid appointment, a saccharine elixir of redaction, Together in cinder-blocked health, we lack the form to want each other rightly, so my wonder spreads egoic and planless, not wanting to pass as reform in bonfired bunks and bedridden poems. I ask again more quietly, rejuvenate my cruelty, for there is no sovereign music for our desire. So this one's from the, um, this last section uh, called Sovereign Exhaustion after that, um, after kind of riffing off of that Rimbo translation. And I'll just read um, maybe three more. This one's called Blur Me Out. I've been up all night trying to figure out how to want loud enough to tie myself up and out into the after all of this luxurious thraldom that keeps me in the way of myself and my poem's perennial body. Autonomous bottom seeking non-sovereign top. Spit up into me so my digestive tract can get a full night's sleep while the star's algorithm churn out millions, squeezing light years, inciting a humming that clocks my little shapes of pain. They look different erupting out of this sinkhole of massive unseeing, my right now controversy vivid and on lock. I am all submitted to you, like you submit to the blossoming that happens in the siloed collective gut and gray water, a bacchanal inside us. We found each other under here, so we return the symbols we bought. We concoct new drives and partial objects. We barricade the speed bumps, disentangle the mission of highways. There, where we are mother of each other, where we are brothers, baby birding disobedience to our sense of self, cashing in on the reels residue. But here, call it stardust, call it umami, call me nobody. Blur me out. Serenity post. Day, body, breathing. If I follow this seeing, what city summits can I conceive of? And how deep in the dirt can I rest my question, unwind my tide? break the law till it's broken, and together fossilize the known measures, hushed like nostalgic traces of rope marks imprinted around your wrists. Machine song, my forensic shame. This unconditional love in escrow, where a partial third party mediates my view of glistening dirt and faded starlight. I'm scared of the overexposed times when I disappear you behind yourself and with sun spotted vision, I'm left with only myself to love. Adoration, reinvented time. Some days I whisper my name quietly to myself, a rotund hypochorism blossomed and swooping to usher in a new day and age where the horizons my trade and I turn back toward earth, tilting forward my graced pelvis, my arched foot bent around a lucite sun. 
ecstatic form, risk, surge. Some days I cross hydrate myself with clouds and tidal chores. The earwigs scatter in dismay. The dusk relocates, displacing the invasive bougainvillea. Little reminders like thunder cake the oat encrusted pan, and I intertwine my aloneness with your piles of clothy barricade. Kill, fuck, marry. The screen, the window, the sky. Discarding all threshold, possessed out of possession, I adjust my sense of what is coming to what is already here. Together, the beach crowd calculates distant showers. A superstitious couple blames the traffic. Mattresses pile up on curbs, creaking. A detox pomegranate branch bends under its blossoms, spectacular and paranoid. The perennial flowers mask up, multiplying like plastic, floating on camouflage fences. And I'll read just one more. This is the last poem of the book. Sejura Fountain. My ability to conjugate is rocky, swapping melted water for genetic grain, cracking sweet stains and seeping wild winged condensation into my cluttered speaking patterns, all sejura out. My inch wants a mile. It wants to balloon that gap, all O's in there, machining a nothingness to loop and loop under the fountain's infrastructure, where of course I crave the imperceptible stone. I used to speak a language that shone in the that shown in the galvanized pipe dream of me, a subsidized starlet, my breath indiscreetly unknown. I loved and loved that crusted neglect, that secret punishment, so sweet where water fell, so water, so dusty, with all that caked up future conditional recycled and trapped in the same water as last year, the year before. My machine yearns for flood and for fire that can't be put out with piss. Imagination some great stalwart of discipline, like a strict fungal network on Molly in the time space of the marble pores of being here, holding your hand. A sadness is stalking me. It's the shape of a chorus. It's glitchy double vision gone when you look at it, the dark side of the gushing shadow, it's down the drain, it's briny cornucopia of feeling. A total, entangle me, a total entanglement seeps out of me. I'm drinking gallons of it. I am chugging it. I am hydrated, strange, and pissing all the time. This body, a fountain of filtered rocket fuel and helping verbs unlocatable. I let my sejura grow as long as that old fork in the road or the wood pile rots when fire loses interest. His mother always told him the squeaky wheel gets the oil as if oil hadn't already ended the world. I say, let the wheel squeak. Let us squeak until oil is obsolete. Let it rust while we uninvent the wheel. Let us fall in the wheel, Sejura. Let the fountain seep over stone till we feel the damp tips of our shoelaces puddled and enmeshed, a marsh to touch on every surface the light can't find. Pause, spewing pause, to learn this grammatical fact. There is no going forward alone. Thanks. Rosie, thank you so much. Amazing. Wow, what a... I wish I had something more salient to say, but I'm just so grateful to, to you and to Jonah and to everyone for joining us tonight. And I guess we'll ask everyone to unmute for a couple minutes if, so you can hoot and holler and cheer and <laughs> if you would like. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Oh my God. Okay. Can I ask for a slightly special request? So like Rosie, I think we need to talk uh, just a little bit, a little, little bit. And then <laughs> maybe, you know, I don't mean to hijack this thing, but I'm just like, me and Rosie have to talk a little bit. And then so maybe if, you know, while we're talking, <laughs> if, if, you know, if there are a couple questions that are out there, if you feel like it, go and do it. But Rosie, I'm just thinking like, you know, how exquisite the language, right, that you deploy um right and it's like arrangements in its forms and it's so interesting right because you know, I'm, I'm in this space where i'm thinking about you know the time i spent at eastern and thinking about you know the, the connection stuff like that and how it informs how it really truly did inform the work and it also informed the foundation of our right of our writing right um <clears throat> and i think this is a great time because everybody's here is just you know a great time to just talk about a little bit like you know what we got from that, from Eastern right from that program having that time you know um, I don't think I've seen anything like this in a long time right with Eastern folks so present um, but Eastern Michigan University has such a wonderful program a brilliant program I know it made me the writer that I am um, right and I would not be <laughs> right doing these things or you know you know who knows how my work what it was like right without that training but i was curious how you felt about that you know or if there's anything specific you can talk to me. i started stereotype in rob's class right like so you know rob i remember getting stereotype when it was like literally four or five pages long it only had a somatic experiment and a couple other poems so i'm just curious Rosie, like, you know I'm saying, like oh yeah well i mean absolutely same i started this book in in carla and rob's classes too for sure the I mean, the contemporary forms class, I'm just like, that That class really changed my life and the way I thought about poetics and politics and form and, um, and yeah, and like just language and, and reference and kind of performance, like public appearance and, um, and, you know, the public sphere, like, I mean, just, it really kind of brought together a lot of my political thinking with poetry in a way that totally shaped you know, everything going forward for me. And then I took like Carla's performance class, I think. And I mean, but I just, I'm like always sending those syllabi to people. Like, I'm like, this is, you know, these readings are gonna like, you know, change your yes, life. Yeah, so, speaking like to change so, sound yeah. poetry class. I try to yeah. run a sound poetry class. My like just Yeah, I can get my wallet. <laughs> oh, I think somebody didn't mute. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like, so, like all of those class, right? All those things that you know we kind of got there, you know, and um, uh, you know, thinking about the syllabi for uh the somatic Rob somatics class and the documentary writing class, right? So like you know now that my work is is has been contextualized so heavily and so deeply as being both documentary work and somatic work and performance stuff, I'm like you know it is really kind of you know this is a full circle, a huge full circle moment, I think you know. Uh, for us, really, you know, in thinking about how, you know, they did really kind of inform, you know, the, the processes that we, we have now. Um, uh, and there's some specific things, right, you know, because I'm hearing like the parataxis in your work, right, <laughs> you know, and and, and I'm, I'm like, like seeing and, Rob's grid on the whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> I teach with that grid all the time. That's how I teach. Yeah, me too. like, <laughs> <laughs> You know, so it's uh, it's just really interesting to you know to get to see how that work right because we're coming also from two you know not completely different you know we do have a Venn diagram right going on in our work right um, you know it has similarities has differences right but you know we two it might seem dissonant or it might seem too like diametrically opposed places right almost in some ways um, even phenotypically right but it's like <laughs> but it's like thinking of of how the craft, right, is able to hold these complexities and these layers, and it's really the craft, some of the, the, the craft stuff, right? Mm -hmm. there. Um, and, and seeing some of these examples, these samples, right, um, from the work at, at Eastern. So I'm curious, was it was it one thing? So it was a parataxis and non sequitur for me that I kind of really <laughs> held on to. Was it like a, a element or a tool that you really held on to? Oh, oh yeah, I love parataxis. I mean, I'm <laughs> always like, I'm always my like grammar is so paratactical and that I aka run just write like run on sentences basically <laughs> <all the time. laughs> um 
but yeah, I mean, I was really definitely thinking with like the way that Rimbo, you know, uses parataxis. Like I remember talking about that a lot and thinking about the Paris commune and like what parataxis has like remo- removing the, um, what's the word conjunctions, right? Like between and re- removing the like ligature of the grammar and just allowing kind of like, um, on disassociating the logic or the linearity of thoughts and letting them just kind of like clash next to each other, almost like creates this friction where you don't have to apply logic to it. So it can kind of in- disrupt common sense. And I feel like there's this, you know, that, you know, disrupting common sense um, through poetry is such like a um, way that Rob, I think, thinks through, I may say there, I remember like talking about that a lot. Um, and something about just like you, you know, dismantling the sentence or using this like paratactic sentence form, I was found like very productive in putting really different registers of thought, especially when thinking about like the alienation of racial capitalism and like really like obstructed or obscured systems of violence um, in really in contact with intimate daily life was just like letting that language kind of like pool on top of each other. Yeah, I think, you know, that's some of the things, you know, cause um, I write a uh, making new sense and nonsense, you know, um, kind of workshop, and where we really look right. at Paris. Are you? Yeah, are you yeah. Uh huh. Cool. And it, yeah, it has a lot of these things, right? You know, it's thinking about right um, that kind of burden. Um, it's a weird, you know, it's a weird burden when you really try to make sense, right? In your work, you know, you're trying to make sense. You know, you're trying to like literally make logical sense, right? You're, oh, it's so much weight, so much bearing on that. We feel like that's what you need to connect, right? Sense is how we connect, right? That's how we ostensibly think about it, right? But it's not really. It's it's doing a, it's a, it's it's where I would use you know the disabuse. You know, it's really good to disabuse, right? <laughs> this is like <what> that, right? <laughs> right? You know, ourselves from having to carry that burden, carry that weight, right? Especially when we're trying to attend to something so complicated and so complex, right? Number one is, oh, this shit is ridiculous, right? The fact that we're beings on this earth doing this thing is always ridiculous. It's always gonna be crazy and ridiculous, right? So even trying to use like to attend to that period is ridiculous, right? It's, 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 it misses the point, right? <laughs> this shit is crazy. Everybody just think about how weird it is to be alive, right? You just really think, right? You know, like this shit is strange. <laughs> you know and so and so i think those forms and those um those are uh, kind of maybe asyntactical <laughs> you know or kind of you know positions or you know because it's that that position how things are positioned right text as an object and the objects of the image how they get oriented in space right and that relation that parallel relationship that you know we try to manipulate right through the work you know i'm, I'm you know that um you know unturned back towards the earth right that's that's what the, that's that kind of precision in the image that you know can can get pulled out once you you know kind of have that uh, strong awareness right of the way objects even text positions itself right in making sense um imagistic sense lyrical sense which your work makes a ton of right <laughs> and it's the you know, that musical quality right and thinking about what do we privilege Right, and doing and making this. And so it's like, you know, just hearing this and thinking about some of these conversations that, you know, I'm sure we've had either, right, distantly right, or together because of the program we went to, but seeing how it came out in the work and how it really is doing the work a lot, of, how that, that did the work a lot of service. And, you know, because it was just, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you are killing me. I mean, that's and what like, I feel like years. It's like, a, it's like, it was, yeah. I, I'm and I, the way I also I'm so I wish everyone could I mean I mean many of you probably have read stereotype but if you haven't it's like the way that the words are performing on the page like it's the performance isn't only spoken right like the tech the the way the text becomes these like perform this these like performing objects like the text is an object on the page and it's just, I mean, the way that, that your whole book is thinking about performativity of text and, and taking up the space of the page. And it's so cool to hear you perform them because I've read them so many times. Um, and I could see them, you know, like when you're reading them, when you're, when you're saying them, I could, you know, I don't even think you were reading, you were like <laughs> chanting, but like I could see, them <laughs> page, like, you know, it, it's just, in, yeah, the way, um, you're using performativity on so many levels. I'm just so obsessed with and, and learned so much from. Yeah, likewise, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, I'm like, it's this, 
I, I don't know how to describe it because I want to kind of encapsulate it, but I can't, but you know, when it comes to the work, and this is the first time I got a chance to, you know, um, not only kind of perform with you, but also witness, you know, your performance, um, you know, too, um, and so intimately also, um, you know, in my childhood room, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so it's like, it's this way that, you know, like, it's, it's like, I don't want to say like meditative, but it's like, I don't know. It's like it really changes the way you see the world, and you can't really, see, you know. And that's a major, you know, accomplishment, right? For work is literally when you see the world differently, right? Slashing the throats of my parking spaces. Good God! <laughs> it was, it was just, good God! Right? <laughs> right? But that's the only way we can, I guess, exist in the world is just keep seeing it differently, right? Because it's trash. <laughs> <laughs> in the way of this being so like if we don't keep trying to see it differently if we don't keep trying to do that right what your work accomplishes we, yeah. we don't ever actually live maybe yeah so whew, and, and i'm about to cry i mean same i'm so yeah i know we probably will are you all right thank you all for sticking I'm, I'm gonna, is, is that a good space to end it do we have more <laughs> thoughts or should we all go should we all leave and cry now Oh my god! Like, I'm gonna go smoke a cigarette and cry. I think. Great. Yeah. All right. Let's not. Yeah, Thank you so out. much. Thank you so much. We, uh, this, this was such great. a delightful so reading. Great. Thank you both. Thanks to everyone for joining us. And Thanks yes, so to the person those, who just those asked. Those intros, those intros is really well. I'm like, geez, those intros really. Just, oh, thank you. I know. I'm wow. here, like, do you want me to be able to do this? <laughs> no. I couldn't write them if you guys didn't write. So I'm you know, grateful to the both of you. This is, this is a great community space to be in, a great community to you know be joined in. And so I thank all of y'all so much. Mm, thank you. Take care. Whew. All right. I'm gonna take care. Thank you, everybody. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Be well. Thank you.